This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, welcome to the second of this Academic Years Studies of Home seminar, and I'm delighted to welcome um, a stalwart attendee of the seminar, um, other side of the table tonight, uh, Vicky Holmes, um, who has been at the University of Essex uh, and will be somewhere else very soon. Yes. Um, and in between institutions. In between <laughs> institutions, which is the best place to be, probably. Um, uh, Vicky has thesis, uh, which was completed in... 2012? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Was used a variety of sources to explore the working class domestic interior and coroner's mm. uh, reports in yep. particular, which was very um, gruesome to read, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, and since then she's been working on uh, both the material culture of the working class interior uh, and lodges in the working class home, um, has published articles in uh, home cultures which she will tell you herself is currently on open access, so definitely okay. now, um, <laughs> uh, uh, about lodges, uh, one on penny dreadfuls. Uh, no, penny, penny, uh, penny, oh, lamps, penny, right? penny lamps. Oh, penny, penny lamps. Penny lamps, yeah. And did you not the, the penny... The, the penny, the it was, uh, it's called penny death traps. There the, we go. Um, penny death traps. The perilous penny lamp. No, no Parliament. Pe- ah. and, oh yeah, lots it, of yeah, yeah, lots of peas. Yes. Of review, anyway. <laughs> and she's uh, currently working on a book proposal on uh, sleeping spaces mm. in the working class home, of which more of tonight. Yes. Yeah. So thank you very much. Could you also just, uh, if you are a late attendee, please could you sign the book? Okay. Well, yeah, this was going to be a chapter in my book, but actually it's now been cut up and it's now in various chapters. Um, but it does make, I think, for a nice little conference paper, or, or a, a seminar paper. Um, but yeah, forewarning, some of the... It isn't too gruesome, this one. Um, I, I do have... There aren't too many people burnt to death. They're usually the, uh, the horrific ones. So, in 1900, the Ipswich Journal's report, Life in an Ipswich Court, detailed the death of an infant who, the jury determined, had died as a result of suffocation upon being overlain by his mother, Mrs Capon. The inquest report revealed that the Capons, only having recently left the workhouse, admitted during Mrs Capon's confinement, had taken up lodgings with a woman named only as Mrs Brown in the report. The father, James Capon, it was stated, earned a precarious livelihood as an umbrella mender. The Capons then moved into a three-room court dwelling in Anchor's Yard. Not long after moving into Anchor's Yard, the Capon's infant died, necessitating a coroner's inquest. Upon going to the Capon's home to view the body lying in situ, as the juries frequently did, the jury found it consisted of one living room and two bedrooms, and was devoid of furniture, excepting a table, chair and a bed in the downstairs living room. The mother called to provide testimony as to the events surrounding her infant's death, stated the little one slept with her and her husband and they lived in a state of dire poverty. We spend a bit, uh, significant proportions of our lives sleeping and yet while the history of sleep has been widely explored, the history of sleeping spaces has until recently remained relatively unexplored. In the case of the 19th century, this gap has begun to be addressed in the terms of middle class home and more recently Jane Hamlet, Leslie Hoskins and Rebecca Preston's project at Home in the Institution has provided minute details on the sleeping spaces of those at the lowest 19th century society residing in institutions and I imagine many of you here today have already sampled the discomforts of the coffin bed at the project's recent exhibition at the Jeffrey Museum. Um, I didn't because there were too many people around and uh, so I was like I don't think so, but I did see many people climb into it. Um, but still, it's, it still it is evident that the sleeping spaces of the classes nestled in between these two levels of society is, uh, is missing. My current research is attempting to address this gap for a study of the material and domestic arrangements of sleeping spaces in the homes of the 19th century working class, where I've been uncovering bedtimes, descriptions of bedrooms, bedsteads, beds and bedding, and details of bed sharing, and uh, if less we see, I've also found wallpaper references um, is a new one as well. Um, in today's paper, I'm going to explore one particular aspect of my findings, which is living spaces and sleeping spaces. The living spaces of the working class home were regularly brought into use at night to accommodate sleeping bodies. 
One fortunate aspect of the source I use, which I'll return to discuss in more detail shortly, is I can establish a room's main purpose as used by the inhabitants themselves through their testimony as they name the rooms, that, so you know, living room, sitting room, bedroom, and therefore I can easily delineate uh, living spaces from dedicated bedrooms. Obviously, in the case of the single room dweller, this is another ba matter, but in today's paper, I'm going to focus on those homes with two or more rooms, which contain at least one bedroom and one living space. But first, I just need to term, uh, what, what I mean, what I mean, I first need to clarify just what I mean by the term working class. Um, it, it's obviously, there's many different interpretations, interpretations of this, um, but due to reliance on the perception of outsiders, such as the writings of slummers and social investigators, there's been a real overemphasis in the historiography of the working class home in terms of the experience of the city slum dweller. Moreover, with the problems attempting uh, to gain access to nocturnal spaces, our understanding of sleeping spaces has largely been limited to inhabitants of the lodging house. More recently, however, historians including myself, Julie Marie Strange and Megan Doolittle have moved away from the focus of the um, material and domestic life of the urban slum dweller to encompass the whole of the working class. This includes a vast array of peoples, both socially and economically, from unskilled labourers to skilled artisans, living in vastly different dwellings. As Julie Marie Strange highlights, the housing of the working class ranged from one or two rooms in so-called slums to agricultural cottages to terrace houses with bay windows. The significant inclusion here is the agricultural cottage, as if we're still lacking a deep knowledge of the urban working class dweller's home, then our understanding of the material and domestic life of the working class rural, de uh, rural dweller has been, in comparison, almost non-existent. So how are we managing to gain access to those homes under the umbrella term, the working class? Well, before I answer this question, I suppose I'd better just briefly define what I mean by home in my own research. Um, to put it simply and briefly, the homes I examine in this particular study are those dwellings which are physically separated from others by an external front door, whether one ingressing onto the street or another outdoor space. They're not always necessarily completely private due to the presence of lodgers in many homes. Strange and Doolittle's work crosses these thresholds using working class autobiographies, and these can reveal much about the material goods and the daily dynamics of family life in the Victorian and Edwardian home. In their work on father's chairs and grandfather's clocks, we find these opened up to the reader. And from my own research, it looks different on that screen. <laughs> and from my own research um, of autobiographies, you do occasionally get snippets of sleeping arrangements within these texts. Um, and for example, here, this is um, an account of the late 1880s home of Elizabeth Bryson in her autobiography on Look Back in Wonder. And as you can see, there's various different sleeping arrangements within here, um, including people being slept in a room where a piano is, presumably that's the parlour, um, and as well, couch sleeping as well. However, autobiographies do not yield all the information I'm seeking in relation to the nocturnal, material and domestic arrangements of the working class. Bedtimes are a notable example of this. Um, finding references to um, bedtimes is, is been quite difficult, but actually with the coroner's inquest, I think I'm now up to 300 bedtimes, um, which means I can now put more in grass and they'll be statistically significant. And what's very nice, particularly with the inquest, is they'll go, I went to bed at 10 o'clock, my usual time or I went to bed at nine o'clock but this was early because I had to be up early for work the next day or I went to bed at six because I was unwell so I can also look at the way these adjust in the household. Um, so fortunately you know the, the, the coroner's inquest supply a vast amount of details not just on um, bedtimes but also many other aspects of sleeping in the working class home. So using inquest uh, reports in the local press in addition to surviving coroner's inquests I say surviving coroner's inquest because a lot of them have been destroyed. In the case of Ipswich, uh, where I look at, uh, most of the Ipswich inquests were actually destroy destroyed in a fire. Um, but thankfully, the newspapers have recorded these in detail. Um, so I've now been exploring the nocturnal homes and uh, the nocturnal urban and rural homes of East Anglia's working class, which have now, uh, until now, remained largely hidden from view. Inquest reports are a curiously overlooked source in the study of the 19th century working class home because they grant such an unprecedented amount of access to the home <coughs> and the lives of the inhabitants within through their own te testimonies without the taint of memory or nostalgia. Um, the inquest reports contain a wealth of detail on the sleeping spaces and sleeping arrangements and these are provide provided by the inhabitants, often just hours arising from bed. 
Um, and there's lots more detail, I won't go into too much detail, but lots more detail can be found in my Home Cultures article and it's currently free to download. I only discovered this the other day when I went to get myself a copy and uh, so I don't know how long it is. So if you are interested in reading about my methodology, um, it is currently free So and I don't know how long it will be free for because um, it, I didn't pay for it to be open access and it doesn't say where's its limit. But uh, I have had slight adjustments as I've moved into looking at the bedroom. Uh, when I was looking at the living spaces, I was very much focusing on domestic accidents um, but when you're wanting to look at sleep actually all different types of inquests I don't use I generally I don't use murder and suicide because that covers more unusual kind of circumstances that have gone on so I look at very natural I look at natural deaths um, as well as accidental deaths to kind of gauge what's going on in the uh, sleeping arrangements so what do the inquest reports, along with the surviving coroner's records, have to tell us about living spaces and sleeping spaces in the homes of East Anglia's working class? This paper reveals that keeping rooms, which is a colloquial term for a multifunctional living space, living rooms, sitting rooms, kitchens, lean-tos and even parlours were brought into use by the working class household to accommodate sleeping inhabitants for an array of reasons, such as poverty, as demonstrated in the opening example, overcrowding, illness, neglect, inebriation, and to accommodate elderly relatives, visitors and lodgers. Moreover, one not only finds sleeping inhabitants in these rooms, but sometimes also bedsteads, or more often, makeshift beds. It's been well documented that an overcrowded home resulted in some working ch class children being displaced from the bedroom. Um, and there's an image here from the Museum of London showing, uh, I got sent this by someone going, oh, I've got a nice picture of bed for you. And then I realized that behind them is a range. So it's actually living room sleeping. So I was very pleased, my, uh, I have to credit Oliver Betts to uh, finding this picture for me. Um, but you, there's also, and I've got evidence of this in the 19th century inquest for East Anglia. I've also got instances of children being sent to grandparents' homes to sleep older children being cast out of the family's home to seek lodgings. While continuing the story of the opening example of this paper, the Capons left their four, four of their children with Mrs Brown, paying four shillings a week to accommodate them. However, in the cases I've uncovered in the inquest reports for children sleeping in the household living space in East Anglia, it was not overcrowding, but sickness, which had determined this particular sleeping arrangement. In Jane Hamlet's Material Relations, she states that the middle-class home the serious illness of a mem member of the family could change the configuration of the home. The patient's bedroom or another room would often be set aside or designated as a sick room. In the case of the working class home, however, with its few and often shared bedrooms, sickness would usually necessi necessitate bringing a living space into use to accommodate the sick or to separate the sick from the healthy. And I particularly like this picture because they've made a, a bed from two chairs and I haven't got any East Anglia inquest to do this but I have come across um, inquests in London where mothers are doing the same to, to make um, beds in the actual thing. I think they're also using the counts I've got where they've used what um, Jumery looks at the father's chairs and they've got arms so that the top bit would be for the baby, um, the, the head of the baby where the armless chair would be for the feet. So in the Suffolk village of Chelmonstam, in January 1870, fever had struck the Osbournes' home, taking the life of their five-year-old daughter, Mary Ann Osborne. Coming before the coroner's court, the father's father, Isaac Osborne, a mariner, detailed how fever had altered the sleeping arrangements as well as the domestic duties in his home. His wife Anne, also attacked with fever, was too unwell to attend Mary Ann. He therefore attended to his daughter, and at 11 o'clock on Saturday night, fed her as usual before going to bed. He stated Mary Ann, during her illness, slept on a bed and sofa on, in the lower room. This separated the fever-ridden Mary Ann from the Osborne's three other children sleeping in the chamber above. The examining surgeon stated Mary Ann was well cared for by her parents and did not certainly die from want of nourishment. In contrast, however, in Colchester in March 1840, another inquest details how the sick child was separated from the rest of the household by being forced into sleep in the lean-to kitchen. This particular sleeping arrangement, however, was questioned by the coroner's court as a striking difference in sleeping accommodation in the household was revealed. A coroner's jury determined that William Pryke, aged 11 years of Greenstead, Colchester, had been willfully murdered by his father and stepmother. The inquest report reveals that William was suffering from dysentery 
And during a time, uh, during this time, a neighbour told the coroner's court, William was made to sleep in the kitchen upon pieces of rough wood nailed together with damp, st- damp straw from his, for his bedding. A more vivid description of this space is revealed in the testimony of the relieving officer, having come to the house to convey William to the workhouse. I inquired where he slept and was shown an unsealed lean-to or kitchen, in the roof of which the light was visible through several apertures. On one part, upon the floor, was a construction intended intended for a bedstead. It was formed of two long pieces of a faggot-like stick crossing each other, with no sacking or other bottom. On these laid a parcel of oat straw in a wet, dirty and almost rotten state. There was no protection from the weather and the rain ran in at all directions. I think one can hardly imagine just how cold and um, miserable William must have felt. Um, I've got, I haven't got many um, domestic interior pictures, um, but that's that would be similar to the house um, described in the Williams in, um, in Williams inquest with the lean to. I don't know what point about screen. Uh, with the lean to there, you can see that's a small place, and that would have helped house the boiler and perhaps a sink. So he would have been crammed into that little room, and uh, the door shut onto him. In contrast, William's father, James Pryke, a farm labourer who the inquest states general wages were 10, sh- 10 shillings or 12 shillings a week, his stepmother Hannah Pryke, along with two other children, slept and lived comfortably. They, they all, it was noted at the inquest, had good blankets and sheets on their bed. The stepmother questioned as to why William slept in the lean-to responded, he smells so bad I cannot have in my room. He was incontinent and, she states, besmeared with his own faeces. Although in a later assize report, the stepmother is quoted as saying she would not have the young rascal anywhere where she was. Neighbours' testimony also exposed that William had been beaten by his father and stepmother, so it's possible that sickness was not the only determining factor in William being made to sleep in the lean-to. William's inquest, however, is not the only inquest I've come across where smell and dirt has impacted upon the working-class household's sleeping arrangements. In 1867, some three years after departing from London in search of work as a domestic servant, 23-year-old Charlotte Foreman returned to her widow's mother's home in Bell Lane, Ipswich, who the census showed supported her family by taking in lodgers. Despite four other children aged 17, 14, 12 and 10 years, as well as lodgers residing in the house, the inquest reports reveal that Charlotte slept in a room on her own. It stated Charlotte slept in a bedroom by herself. This was not due to there being a spare room for the elder daughter, but as her mother stated to the coroner's court, such was the destitute condition of my daughter on her return home that I couldn't allow one of my other children to occupy a bedroom with her. I was compelled to burn nearly all her underclothing and that was the reason she slept alone. This privacy of one's own bedroom enabled Charlotte to conceal both her pregnancy and subsequent stillbirth from the rest of the household until Charlotte's mother uncovered the body of a male child in her daughter's box while dusting the room. I'm trying to find out a bit more about uh, Charlotte's life. Unfortunately, I haven't yet found anything about what happened in London. These three years are a bit of a mystery and I'm hoping to kind of track down to see what happened um, considering the state she returned home in but what I have found is that she sends sub- subsequently goes to live with some friends uh, and then is because uh, she was convicted of concealing her pregnancy so she was in prison for a month um, and then she uh, went on and uh, then got committed of theft um, but then she got married and had children um, and everything seems to have panned out okay in the end so it does have a happy ending kind of <laughs> so returning to William's inquest the surgeon called to provide testimony stated that the damp bedding filth and ill usage would have accelerated his illness and resulted in his untimely death his mother was soon thereafter convicted of assault by the assize jury who could not convict her uh, convict her of his death from want of proper care or nour- nourishment because as his stepmother she was not bound by this law William's father was acquitted of any charge Another reason evident in the inquest reports for a living space to function as a makeshift makeshift sick room in the working class home is because they contain the fire, providing warmth and comfort and care to the sick inhabitant. In 1894, the Ipswich Journal reporting on the death of an inhabitant at 17 Stoke Street, Ipswich, detailed the domestic arrangements surrounding the care of one sick inhabitant. Called to provide testimony as to circumstances surrounding the final days of 40-year-old John Last, the labourer, 
Mrs Vincent stated that he had been lodging with herself and her husband for the past 14 years. And just to note, it's not uncommon for people to be lodging this long. I've come across people who've lodged with people for 30 years. Um, and I've also come across n numerous inquests of landladies actually taking on the caring role when their lodger is actually sick. And during his time at the Vincent's home, he had slept in a room described as a place more like a closet than a room, frightfully cold, as cold as in the open air. His bedstead, the report states, was only half covered with a mattress. His legs were resting on the bare irons. I, I'm, I was really pleased with this because I'm um, struggling to discover what the bedsteads were actually made of. So I've actually found one where it references being made with iron, which is, for me, was a, <laughs> a woo moment, I think. But, uh, for this last page, two shillings and sixpence a week, including washing, mending, and his landlady stated seeing after him. Last final hours were spent in the Vincent's sitting room. On, sat on the Saturday preceding his death, after being unwell for some time, he took to his bed upstairs, where he remained throughout Sunday. He was up the whole day on Monday, but kept lying about. On Tuesday, he kept to his bed, at which point his landlady called for a doctor. And I'm also presuming that actually she may have also paid for the doctor as well, and I've come across cases of that happening. Upon examining last, a surgeon, Mr Stannard, finding him in the later stages of pneumonia, told Mrs Vincent to put the man where a fire was. Responding to his request, Mrs Vincent got him downstairs the best she could and then went, get, went to get her husband to help her to rig up the bedstead that was already in the sitting room. When a relation of Lass came to visit on the Tuesday afternoon while Mrs Vincent was fetching her husband, she found Lass sitting on what appeared to be a piece of chair before a very small fire. She told the coroner's court, there was a bed on the floor, there was also a bedstead but it was not yet up. Lass died a few hours later. Whether the bedstead had been put up before his death, unfortunately, is not stated in the inquest report. What is also not in stated in the inquest report is why there was a dismantled bedstead present in the Vincent sitting room. Clearly, it was not just for the purpose of a sick inhabitant. Further testimony provided by Mrs Vincent reveals that her husband, Robert Vincent, had no work and therefore were dependent on the income from lodgers. One can suppose, therefore, that the bedstead was, uh, in the sitting room was used to accommodate extra lodgers to provide additional income. Um, or, um, Leslie Hoskins suggests that this may have actually been for the householder themselves, having turned over their own bedroom to temporary lodgers. Infirmity and, il uh, and illness in old age also brought the living space of the working class home into use on a more permanent basis. In April 1888, an inquest was held in Suffolk village of Framston regarding the death of 71-year-old John Barker. Providing testimony to the coroner's court, his wife stated for the past four months he had been suffering from a kidney infection and during this time he had a bed downstairs to sleep in. The warmth and cosiness of the living space undoubtedly paid a significant contributory factor um, to the infirm and elderly, elderly residents moved downstairs, although this was not without its hazards. Absent fire guards, as can be seen in this image, flammable co clothing and infirmity can pro proved to be a deadly mix on many occasions. I have come across numerous inquests referring to infirm inhabitants when sleeping in chairs by the fire, having fallen in or a spark had denied their clothes and they were unable to help themselves, they soon burnt to death. The inquest reports also illustrate that stairs in such homes may have prevented some elderly and infirm inhabitants from climbing to their bedrooms at night and left them with little option but to sleep downstairs. Um, this isn't a uh, domestic dwelling um, inquest, but this is a particularly uh, good in inquest of the difficulty that uh, the infirm had climbing some of the stairs. And you can have a see with this one, it's, this is in the Birmingham backs to back. Um, and as you can see, there's no handrail. Um, and in nearly all working class homes there were, there were no handrails at this time and no lighting so trying to negotiate those on the way to the bed um, and also there's a, there's a ladder here as well and I'm not sure I could climb that um, so uh, I, d I can't imagine if you're suffering from any infirmity how you would have got to your sleeping chamber above um, there weren't too many people die on these notably just to uh, go to accidents um, what I found is I think because they look dangerous, people are more careful on them and therefore aren't having accident. These kind of staircases, um, yeah, they would they were certainly as um in the case here as well. Um, 
but yeah, so that that was another reason possibly why we find a lot of infirm people sleeping in the downstairs rooms um, because basically, you know, that's where the main fire was. So to go up and down to bed at night um, was a hazardous journey. The inquest reports further reveal that at times of sickness in the working class home, healthy inhabitants were also found in the living spaces at night. In 1867, an inquest was held in Old Heath, Colchester, upon the infant child of Robert Pryor. The father, called to give testimony, disposed he was not at present in any regular work for anyone. The child lost its mother about five months ago to consumption. He occupied a cottage under Mr Lambard. There were three rooms, a keeping room, bedroom and a kitchen. There were six, including himself, living and sleeping in the house. The oldest being 18 and the next 15 years of age, and he had laid on a couch in the keeping room during the illness of his wife. They had all slept in the bedroom before that. Further testimony from a neighbour reveals that Pryor's bedroom contained three beds with no partition, curtain or anything else between the beds. And I myself have yet to come across any inquest reports actually referring to any kind of partition in bedrooms. They're quite noted in a lot of parliamentary literature and, and social literature. But what I'm finding is that there's no reference to these and they're, they're generally quite flammable, these partitions. Um, their absence is noted quite a lot. So I'm wondering how common these partitions actually were um, within working class bedrooms and whether they were actually that bothered about actually separating their beds with blankets because in a cold house who wants to put a blanket up when it could keep you warm so the event of childbirth and following confinement likewise saw husbands displaced in the marital bed in the bedroom and while i've yet to uncover specific references to these men sleeping in a living space there are numerous references to them sleeping elsewhere in the house in homes containing just one or two bedrooms However, what I did discover in the inquest reports is that sickness in these homes were not the only reason I found the male head of the household sleeping in the living space. Inebriation occasioned living space sleeping for some working class men. Um, 63 year old agricultural labourer Aaron Cansdale of View St Mary routinely slept in what the inquest reports refer to as his chair in a downstairs room on the evenings when he returned home in a drunken state. One morning in 1882, however, Aaron Cansdale was found dead by his chair. An inhabitant providing testimony at the inquest stated, On Friday evening, Cansdale went to the beer house and had two pints of beer, returning home at 10 o'clock, apparently the little worse for drink. When he had taken too much beer, as he sometimes did, his practice was not to go to bed, but to sit downstairs in his chair all night. He did this on the present occasion. His wife went downstairs and found him asleep at 12 o'clock returning to her bed thereafter. The next morning, however, he was dead and death was determined as due to natural causes. Mike Hansdale slept in the downstairs um, a chair on his return home from an evening's drinking is not explicitly stated in the reports. Um, perhaps returning to the firm, um, these kind of, if it was a rural home, I can't imagine these staircases, uh, staircase ladders are particularly easy while you're in a drunken state or perhaps he just simply didn't want to disturb the inhabitants sleeping in the bedrooms above. In the case of Woodbridge milk seller Elijah Cat found dead on the hearth rug in the lower room of his head with a uh, lower room of his home with his head upon a pillow it is evident that he was routinely cast out of the marital bed and bedroom when he returned home in a drunken stupor. However as his wife testimony reveals he did not normally even get to cross the threshold of, on his home on these occasions. Elizabeth Capt on her oath saith, the deceased was my husband. Between seven and eight o'clock last night, a boy brought me in my husband's cart home and told me he was coming home. I did not let him come home when he had taken too much to drink and he always laid down in the shed and not go indoors. Um, so between half past, um, oh, I missed my place there. Um, <laughs> so, um, so then she kind of further later on dies that goes to continue. He um, had always slept at the shed or in a pony stable at these times and a verdict was brought of um, natural causes when he was found dead the next day. There is a hint of care, I think, um, for her husband in the inquest reports. She's in this seems to have cast him out. Um, but if we look at it in more detail, she's actually, um, his husband's come into the house at this point and she's actually placed a pillow underneath his head 
to support his head while he's in a drunken state. And even though him sleeping on the hearth rug may have also sounded like the actions of a harsh wife scolding him for being drunk, it's possible that they didn't have a couch for him to actually sleep on. So the hearth rug may have been the most comfiest space within the living room. I don't. I have a debate with this. My husband um, transcribed this in Quest for me because I was doing something else in the, the thing. We have a we have a debate whether this wife was um, nice to her husband or, or not. Um, <laughs> But the living spaces of the working close home, however, were not just used by the household's permanent inhabitants. The most commonly known of these is the Granny's Parlour. Granny sleeping in the parlour is well documented in oral and autobiographical hi- histories spanning the 19th and 20th century. While residential independence is often noted as a preferred choice of both elderly and their adult children in working class communities, this was not always possible. There were some solutions when it was not wanted or feasible for an elderly relative to be accommodated with kin. And one such finding I'm uncovering in the inquest is that some adult children, despite being on very low wages, would place their elderly parents in lodgings. I have a case in Ipswich, for example, where the inquest reveals an elderly father lodging in the house next door to his adult son. When accommodated, in the homes of, uh, when accommodated in the overcrowded homes of kin, we sometimes find grandparents demoted to sharing bedrooms and beds with their young grandchildren. In these homes built with the parlour, however, this room could be set aside to accommodate grandmother. And I say grandmother as I've yet to find references to grandpa sleeping anywhere else but within the child's bedroom or bed when accommodated with kin. In 1879, an inquest held in the Suffolk village of Rumber on the body of Phoebe Bullen, aged 78 years, who died in the home of her daughter, Sarah Ann Gobbold, provided testimony to the, as to the circumstances surrounding the death of her mother. Her daughter stated, my mother lives with me and slept in the parlour on the ground floor. An 1888 inquest report in the Bury and Norwich Post regarding the 70, uh, death of 73-year-old widow Jane Spring of Church Street, Lowestoft, who resided with her widowed daughter. It was stated that she slept in a room below her daughter's upon a bed. Presumably, as it's not explicitly stated in this particular report, this was a living space that had been altered to accommodate Jane upon moving into her daughter's house. As I know this door, I know this particular house was only two floors. You do get some three-story uh, working-class houses in Suffolk, but this was a two-story house. LD grandmothers, however, were not the only extra inhabitants found in the sleeping spaces of the working-class home. Fleeting visitors sometimes would be taken into bedrooms and even the beds of adult inhabitants. Others also in some cases just had to make do with the bed made up on the couch in the living space of the night. Yet in one inquest I've uncovered, a bed was a permanent feature of the living room for the very purpose of accommodating a regular visitor in one Harwich home. In March 1900, the Essex Standard reported an inquest pertaining to the death of 41-year-old spinster Floris Davison, resident of 69 Church Street, Harwich. This was not her own home, but the two-roomed dwelling of her sister, Emily Salter, where Florence had lived on and off for 16 years. I'm not really sure where she lived when she wasn't with them. It's fortunately not stated in the inquest report, and in the census she's just showing up in this household. It is evident from the inquest reports that the presence of a bed and a sleeping body in the living room proved a disruption to the household, domestically and in other ways, as her brother-in-law, Thomas Salter, told the coroner's court. The deceased had been the torment of his life, asked in what way he replied through upsetting his home. Um, This further testimony, he he goes on and on, he was really not happy about it, Um, and he really takes the opportunity of the inquest to, to make sure everyone knows. Um, but yet, with her brother-in-law not in any regular employment, Florence brought vital income into the household, um, paying as, as a lodger would do. On the night preceding her death, Florence retired to bed at her usual time, about 10 o'clock, sleeping in the living room, while Emily, her husband and adult son slept in the bedroom. Um, I'm guessing that they all had to go to bed at the same time um, at this point, because um, unless Emily just took, took herself up in bed while they were all still in the living room. And um, but presumably, when it, although it's not explicitly stated in the inquest report, Florence's bed could be stowed away during waking hours to accommodate daily domestic life. Folding furniture such as tables was a common solution in cramped and busy living spaces. And then uh, illustration here from Edward Cabra's Women's Work and Wages, you can see how the furniture is being pushed aside and folded to make space for work, which would likewise be for the case of the bed. 
Um, you've seen other space saving solutions such as the aforementioned staircase ladder because staircases just take up so much space in these small houses that uh, a ladder was a popular solution especially in rural homes. Um, collapsible fold away beds with another space saving solution such as that mentioned in the Vincent sitting room and also illustrated here in George Godwin's London Shadows um, as you can see here the bed right in the far corner um, and it describes the room as a uh, little more than seven feet long by six feet wide the narrow bedstead which is doubled up in the daytime reaches when let down close to the fireplace and I'm guessing that must have been a bit of a domestic hazard as well because um, uh, these are can be quite flammable things as well uh, as I've discovered in other inquests um, so returning to the Salter's household, I do also wonder if when Florence wasn't present in the house, whether the Salter's adult son slept in the bed in the living room to create some division of sleeping uh, arrangements between him parents and himself. However, this is not the only bed the inquest reports refer to Florence sleeping in. Feeling unwell as the case had been for some months, Florence wished to stay in bed during the day, but with her bed positioned in the family's only living space, she was awoken in, with, in the morning with the rest of the household and moved into her sister's bed in order not to be disturbed or not to disrupt daily domestic life. And it was in this bed that Florence died. A post-mortem revealed that death was due to heart failure, but as I'd like to know, her brother-in-law um, got thoroughly reprimanded by the uh, coroner for uh, the treatment of his sister-in-law. Um, the presence of a lodger in the household frequently resulted in a realignment of sleeping arrangements as well. I've uncovered a multitude of different sleeping arrangements occasioned by the presence of a lodger in the home and in some of these we find inhabitants sleeping in the living spaces. We already know from the work in, uh, on inventories that landladies would sometimes give over their bedrooms to lodgers while them themselves slept in a living space. As Margaret Ponsonby reveals in her stories from home, Anne Chandler in the late 18th century shared her Shrewsbury home with a lodger. The lodger had the upper part of the house while Anne had a kitchen and a parlour downstairs, the latter doubling as a bedroom. Similar cases are also evident in the inquest reports for Victoria and East Anglia. At the 1847 Woodbridge inquest into the death of 76-year-old widow Margaret Copping, it was reported in the Ipswich Journal that she had for the last 12 months been lodging in the house of Mr James Nunn Brazier, having the use of occupation of two rooms being the whole first floor, while James Nunn, along with his niece, resided in the lower rooms. But unfortunately the inquest don't tell me uh, how many lower rooms there were and how um, his niece and uh, James Nunn and his niece were actually arranged in the downstairs rooms. One wonders if Susan Buchan had also given her bedroom over to lodgers. At the inquest into the 60-year-old's death in 1899, it was revealed that she took in lodgers into her four-room domestic dwelling, two rooms upstairs and two rooms downstairs. However, it did not reveal where the lodgers slept. Did a lodger have a bedroom each while she slept downstairs? Or perhaps two of the inhabitants shared a bedroom, perhaps the two lod male lodgers shared the bedroom, um, and perhaps the landlady was sharing a bedroom with the lodger. And this isn't the first, this wouldn't be the first case where actually I've come across not only the landlady sharing a bedroom with her lodger, but also sharing a bed. Um, I've come with, with female lodgers, so you'll have landladies with female lodgers and male lodgers as well. Um, but unfortunately, with this uh, inquest report the, being the only surviving document in regards to the coroner's inquest, the original having gone up in smoke, it's unlikely I'll never know the true sleeping arrangements in the Buchan's home. Lodgers are also found in the living spaces of the working class home, albeit on a temporary basis. As we've seen in the case of the Vincent's household, a dismantled bed was kept in the sitting room for the likely purpose of accommodating a temporary lodger. However, the inquest reports also reveal temporary lodgers sleeping on couches in living spaces. In 1871, Elizabeth Rice, also known as Elizabeth Pratt, took up lodgings with her illegitimate infant's paternal aunt, Mrs Stannard. The Stannard's home, 10 Black Horse Lane, Ipswich, however, consisted of just two rooms to house the Stannards and their three young children. And therefore, after just a fortnight of this arrangement, Rice was forced to seek alternative lodgings after Mr Stannard concluded the accommodation was not sufficient in his house. Where Rice slept in the Stannard's home during this fortnight is not revealed in the inquest report or surviving coroner's record, although it's likely she would have slept in the Stannard's living space given that they had already stated their bedroom was overcrowded. 
Further details, however, are revealed as to her second lodgings, where Rice took up after being forced to leave the Stannards' home, because it was these lodgings in which her infant died. Providing her testimony to the coroner's court as to the circumstances surrounding the infant's death, 71-year-old Mrs Smith stated, I am a shoemaker's widow and I reside at number 13 Black Horse Lane. I take in lodgers. Um, and I've actually looked at this street. Um, it's it's a, a street full of uh, quite small houses. And I think nearly every household within this street are taking lodgers. So it's a popular street for lodgings. But yet no bed was available for Rice when she came to knock at Smith's door. She stated, the last witness, Elizabeth Rice, was a stranger of me stranger to me until last week when she came to ask me if she could lodge here I told her she might sleep at my house for a few nights the last witness slept in my house in the lower room on a couch which Mrs Smith claimed was sufficient to accommodate both this suggests this was not the first time that the landlady had used a couch for such purpose um, what was also quite interesting as well in the inquest is um, Rice comes to her to state she is a married woman and her husband is away and it's implied that she wouldn't have been able to have got this lodging if she'd found out um, that she was a single mother with an illegitimate child. Shedding further light as to her domestic arrangements and accommodation on the couch, Rice told the coroner's court that while at Mrs Smith, she slept on a sofa under a blanket and a quilt, which Henry Gage Moore, surgeon to the police force of the borough, having visited Mrs Smith's home to examine the deceased infant, told the court the bed was made up close by the window. One presumes that with Mrs Smith routinely taking in lodgers, she had the extra bedding at her disposal. Yet in Moore's opinion, the couch was not a suitable bed for the mother and the infant. This is a very common statement by the surgeons at the coroner's inquest, that the beds are never, it doesn't matter, every single bed they come across or any sleeping arrangement, they've always got a criticism. Um, contrary to Mrs Smith's statement, Moore stated, the couch on which the child laid was so narrow that he must have had to lay close to his mother, resulting in being overlaid. Now, privacy was also one thing that lo visitors, lodgers and others sleeping in the living space would have forfeited uh, when sleeping here. Uh, returning to an image from an earlier slide which I didn't actually discuss is, um, is a floor plan and what we see missing from here is a hallway and this wasn't still a very uncommon um, in East Anglia's working class homes to have hallways and landings as again like the staircase they took up valuable space. External doors would therefore simply open directly onto living spaces which had been passed through by inhabitants making their way to bed. And this is very much given the idea to the, uh, the home as a thoroughfare, rise the idea of the home as a thoroughfare. As we can, I try to avoid using Dickens um, pictures, but I think this is a particularly good one here where uh, you can see just the door and the way it comes into all the living space and everything's for view. Um, I'm not quite sure that there's that many people in the kind of ones that I'm looking at, living spaces I'm looking at. It's very chaotic, that one. Um, and I'm not sure how representative this are of living spaces. I try to not use uh, the ones depicted in the literature because I think with a lot of the uh, living spaces described come across, they're not quite reflective in what's coming up in the slum fiction. So, the lack of privacy from the absence of such divisions is evident in an 1890 inquest report in the Bury and Norwich Post on the sudden death of a 50-year-old single waterman and domestic dwelling lodger William Halls in the small Suffolk town of Brandon. And while it isn't in the living space, it really does illustrate just the lack of privacy through not having hallways or landings. Providing testimony to the coroner's court, Mrs Tilney stated that Halls was her lodger and they had adjoining bedrooms. Tilney told the coroner's court that she often heard Halls, a habitual drunk, retching during the night. So on the night of his death, she paid little attention to the noises coming from his room. However, she stated at 3.30 a.m., all rush, what I find is quite interesting is she knew it exactly was 3.30am so I'm trying to work out as well as his clocks in these bedrooms. Um, at 3.30am uh, Hall rushed into her bedroom through which he would have passed to get downstairs. He was choking and black in the face and it was concluded that he had um, had a bit of carrot before going to bed which had somehow got in his lungs and that had killed him. I'm not really sure whether that is a viable <laughs> medical cause of death. Um, but, uh, yes, it, um, yes but with, there's, there's another matter in to do with the inquest is that uh, I've read a lot of, to do with the overlaying children in particular, having read the medical testimonies and looking at 
new research on overlaying, so many of these women were told they'd overlaying their infants, where the evidence actually suggests now that these infants would have died of many other causes. I think that's probably one of the saddest findings, I think, of, uh, of my thesis. So, in summary then, the inquest reports revealed that the living spaces of the working class home also served as a sleeping space beyond those homes as a single, uh, single room dweller. Not only do we find sleeping inhabitants in the multifunctional living spaces, lower rooms, keeping rooms and lean-to kitchens, but also in sitting rooms and the sacrosanct space of the parlour. Children, the elderly, the sick and infirm, extended family, visitors and lodgers, and even the male head of the household can all be found sleeping in the living spaces, although notably I have yet to find a housewife sleeping in the living space. Of the causes of why people are sleeping in living spaces, poverty overcrowding is really well documented with this. Um, although, as we've seen in the opening example, the poverty that determined the Capon's living room sleeping arrangements was not a lack of bedrooms, but a lack of bedsteads. There were, however, a multitude of other reasons that determined living space sleeping. Sickness in the household seems to have been the commonest reason for bringing the living space into nocturnal use, whether to separate the sick from the well, or to keep a sick inhabitant warm and comfortable by the fire, or because infirmity simply prevented them to, from climbing the, uh, the stairs to their own bed. Inebriation also seems to have occasioned living space sleeping, although in the case of Elijah Cat have we uh, we've seen, the shed or stable was his sleeping accommodation when he normally turned, uh, returned home drunk. These rooms were also used to accommodate additional members of the household or sometimes by the household's permanent residents when they had given their own bedrooms over to an extra inhabitant. Yet living space, space sleeping, with the possible exception of the rarely used best room, had its limitations both in terms of disruption to daily living and on the privacy of inhabitants, so it was generally not built into permanent use as a sleeping arrangement. So alongside uh, the sleeping inhabitants, bedsteads were also sometimes found in the living space. The ones that you could easily be dismantled and perhaps folded away when not in use in order to accommodate daily domestic life. Though more common, probably due to the unnecessary cost of an additional bedstead that wouldn't be in regular use is some form of makeshift bed in the living space. In the case of William Pryke, his lean-to sick bed appears to have literally been knocked up with bits of rough wood and straw. Temporary beds, however, were usually made up on a sofa or a couch in the living space, although the inebriated seemed quite com comfortable sleeping in a chair or even upon the hearth rug with a pellet pillow to rest their head. So what does the use of living spaces as sleeping spaces have to tell us about the working class home? I think the living space sleeping is a really good example of just how dynamic and flexible the working class home had to be. Every room uh, served more than one function beyond its intended purpose, and not one room was immune from housing a sleeping inhabitant at some time in an, uh, or another when circumstance dictated practicality overall privacy. Likewise, furniture, in this case the sofas, couches and chairs, were not just used for sitting but also for sleeping, which I think is something with uh, looking inventories as well. We don't, nece we don't necessarily assume rooms being used for sleeping because we, we can't see a bed in it, but perhaps we need to think about there may be couches in there and therefore actually some of these can actually be used as um, permanent beds for some people. Nevertheless, it's also evident in most working class homes, living space sleeping was not a permanent domestic arrangement, as even when this was a semi-permanent arrangement, such as the case with the Salter's long-term familiar visitor in the living space, sleeping caused much disruption to the daily running of the household. And I just wanted to end up with this quote. This is um, by a social investigator, Alexander Patterson, in his Cross of Bridges, where he uh, says there's no sharp distinction between what is and what is not a bedroom. Where homes are small and families are large, there must be a bed in, sort, in every sort of room. And I, I've popped the question mark because I think this is perhaps overstating the use of all the rooms. And I think this, these rooms are still very much used for their intended purpose. And the idea of having a sleeping inhabitant isn't generally they, 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 in the living space, unless obviously it's a single room dwelling. Um, and it's very, they're still very aware that this is their living space and this is their sleeping space. And they still go to uh, great efforts to delineate that. So, thank you.